Open up your Bibles, if you could, too. The second book in the Bible, the book of Exodus. I was in Seattle this week for a few days visiting my twin brother who I don't get to see very often and it was depressing. Not because of my brother. That part was fun. It was depressing because I traded in 80 degree weather, shorts, t-shirt, flip-flops for incessant rain. Well, now, we started off the, the trip and it was actually snowing, which was cool, but after that it was pretty much rainy and dreary and bleak. And and for those of you who are from the the North Pacific Northwest area, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It was, well, it was Seattle. In Seattle, I think, I think, my opinion, rain is your enemy. But it's not like that in Arizona. When you come back to Arizona, rain is is not just your your enemy, but rain is your, your friend. I love the Arizona rain. I love, I love that you can tell when rain in Arizona is coming. You can smell the rain about to come, can't you? Right before the heavens open up and dump out their blessing of wetness on this desert land, you can, you can actually smell the rain is coming. I can smell that smell this morning. Gospel rain is coming this morning. The heavens are about to open up and dump out their blessedness of grace upon us this morning and for the next six months as we begin to march our way through the book of Exodus where we are going to walk together along the dusty roads of the land with Moses and with the nation of Israel and we're going to stand witness through this book to their deliverance from slavery in the nation of Egypt. As we study the the book of Exodus together, we stand as witnesses to God's great sovereignty in his deliverance and his sovereignty over the affairs affairs of, of all the nations of the world, including Egypt, including Israel, including our own. So by way of introduction to this book, it's going to add a little bit of time to the message this morning, but I want to make sure that as we enter into this book of Exodus, we're entering together on the same page. And so here's what we're going to find when we study this book. Three things I want to draw our attention to before we we actually hit the text. First, Exodus is relevant. The book of Exodus is relevant. Though the, the world that we're going to read about and we're going to study and find here is wildly different than the world that we have in some ways. In other ways, it's, it's still very much the same. Their problems in the book of Exodus can be explained by sin. And their solutions can be explained by God, which is just the same as us today. Moses, who is the author of the book of Exodus, we're going to read his own autobiographical description of his life in this story. He is a sinner just like you, just like me. He encounters the holiness of God who is working for his good. And it changes everything. And that's true for us, and we're going to see how through the book of Exodus. And so this is not just ancient history as you come to this story. It's telling a story for us. In fact, the Apostle Paul picks up not only on this theme, but he actually quotes and uses the themes of the book of Exodus as he writes these words in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 6. Here's what he writes. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud. We're going to see all these things as we study Exodus together. And all passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Verse 6, now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. So, 
we're supposed to come to this book to help us with our walk in holiness. This book of Exodus stands as an example for us that we might not desire evil as they did. So don't be surprised if as we go through this book that you might start off thinking, wow, this is a dry and incredibly boring book that God surprises you and you find your life extremely challenged by the relevancy in your own life. So that's first thing. Exodus is relevant. Second, Exodus is important. Exodus is a very important book in the Bible. It's a very important book in the Old Testament. Exodus means to get out. And we're going to see the story of God getting his people out of, of the bondage of slavery from Egypt in chapters 12 through 14. That's the specific event of the Exodus. And this event that we're going to, we're going to march our way towards and are, is going to follow in chapter, chapter 12 and 14 it is the watershed event of the whole Old Testament. Future generations write about this event. Future generations look back upon this event. It's, it's referred to at least 20 times specifically in the Old Testament alone. And the numbers of allusions to the Exodus throughout the Bible, including in the New Testament where Jesus himself is referred to as the Exodus in Luke 9, it, it's staggering how many times this event is referenced. It is seared into the consciousness of God's people. Much in the way that Pearl Harbor defined an older generation, much in the way that for some of us, 9-11 defines our generation and casts shadow over everything that we do and lives within the background of the way that we live our lives. I can tell you that's true because I flew on an airplane this week. The Exodus stands as this event. So this book is important to help us understand the history of God's people, the history of the Old Testament. But it's even more than that. Exodus is important, point three, because it points to Jesus. Exodus points to Jesus. Okay, so listen. We need to study the book of Exodus as Jewish scriptures, but we need to preach the book of Exodus as Christian scriptures. We need to study it as Jewish scriptures. We need to understand the original Jewish context. We need to understand that Moses is the author. He's writing to the nation of Israel as they're wandering in the wilderness, trying to make their way to the promised land. And they're confused about what God is doing. We need to understand how that impacts what's being written here. We need to understand Moses' goal in writing these words and how the original hearers would, would, would take what he's writing and why it would bring a benefit to them. But we have to also understand that Exodus foreshadows the coming of a greater deliverer than Moses. It points forward to a greater deliverer from a greater imprisonment, from a greater punishment of a people who are in a deeper bondage to give a greater future and a greater inheritance than anything that this text itself says. It points forward to the great mediator of Jesus Christ. Amen. We all drink from the rock who is Christ. Amen. Moses, the nation of Israel, as they follow God, and us at Grace Church. So the God of Exodus is the God of Grace Church. And so Exodus is relevant, Exodus is important, and Exodus points us forward to Christ. So let that cause your heart to well up with anticipation and let it help you to smell the rain as we come this morning to God's words. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you have preserved this scripture not just to teach us about ancient history, but Lord, to reveal yourself to us through the way that you worked in history, through the way that you loved a people, through the way that you demonstrated your sovereignty, by the way that you overcome evil, by the way, God, that you have promised and fulfilled your faithfulness in countless ways throughout the book of Exodus. Your word is written as an example for us. So as we gather together as your people this morning in Christ, we pray that your word would speak to us about Christ and would help us to see your work of Christ 
his coming, his living, his death, his resurrection, which we've already celebrated, that you'd help us to see it magnified through this word. Lord, impact our hearts to treasure you today above all things. Cause us, Lord, to trust you in all things. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Exodus is the sequel to Genesis. Now, some of you were with us last summer when we preached through the story of Joseph, chapters, Genesis chapters 37, and we ended in chapter 50, the end of the book. If you were with us in that time, you saw that God blessed his people through Joseph. You remember he saved, the, the, he saved Joseph's whole family during the time of famine by bringing them from their land into Egypt. And in Genesis 47, 5, we read that Joseph found favor with Pharaoh, and Pharaoh let Jacob and his brothers all, and the the extended family all settle in the land of Goshen. And Genesis ends with Joseph's death and the promise that God would bring his people back to the land that was promised them. So Genesis ended. Exodus picks up right where Genesis left off. In fact, it's not in the translation here, but the first word in the Hebrew of Exodus 1.1, the very first word is and. So Genesis 50 ends, and then we read in verse 1, and, and the story continues. Let's read together in verse 1. And these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died and all his brothers in all that generation. Now this is just what we would expect and what we remember if we've come to the end of Genesis. We remember that this story, and Moses wants to communicate to to the Israelites and then to us, that this story of this exodus is rooted and founded in the promise and faithfulness of God to the patriarchs. First to Abraham, then to Isaac, then to Jacob. And so he's recounting this this setting as a transition. Well, we already knew that. Verse 7 takes us one step further. Verse 7. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. Literally, that word can be translated swarmed. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. You know what Moses is doing as he sets up this scene? Not only is he communicating about God's promise and faithfulness to the patriarchs, but as he describes this verse in verse 7, he's reminding the people of God that God is being faithful even back to his creation mandate in Genesis 1.28 as God gives Adam and Eve their instructions. Keep one eye on verse 7 and, and one ear open to verse, as I read Genesis 1.28 and see if you can pick up the, the overlap in the language. So Genesis 1.28 says, And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now we could take a whole Sunday and talk about the sanctity of life and the blessing of children and those kinds of things from this text. But what Moses wants us to hear and feel as he's writing these words to the Israelites, is that God is faithful and has been faithful to bless his people. And his plans and his promises are being fulfilled. As the book of Exodus starts, he wants us to know that the plan that was put in motion in paradise is coming to pass through Abraham's seed. They are indeed multiplying. They are indeed filling the earth. And God is blessing Israel And children are the evidence of the blessing. So where Genesis is the story of God's chosen family, now we're starting to see that the chosen family gives way to the chosen nation, the nation of Israel. But verse 8 
Verse 8 introduces us to a major problem. Read with me. Now, there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Now, let me just put a pause on the story for a second and just insert that prosperity is one of those things that seems to turn on a dime. And we all know this because we've just lived through one of the most difficult recessions our country has walked through and depressions and are still in the midst of it in some ways. One day you can have the right job, you can have the right deal, you, everything can be working out for your good, and by the end of the close of business, it's all gone. And that's what we see here. The Pharaoh who saw Joseph and Joseph's God and Joseph's people as a blessing to the nations was gone. And seemingly overnight, a new king arose who didn't know God and who didn't see God's people as a blessing, but saw God's people as a threat. Re-enter the story in verse 9. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, too late, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Listen, Pharaoh is putting the heart of unbelief on full display. This is the heart of unbelief. The heart of unbelief looks upon God as a threat, not a blessing. The heart of unbelief looks at God's word and sees threats, not blessings. The heart of unbelief looks at the gospel of Christ and sees a threat, not a blessing. I remember thinking exactly this way when I was in college and I came across the truth of the gospel. You know what, you know what my issue was? My, my main issue wasn't whether or not Jesus was real or whether he lived or whether he was a historical figure or whether there was enough evidence to believe. No, my initial fear, as I was confronted with the truth of Christ, my initial fear was if I believe in this Jesus that's preached to me and proclaimed to me from the Bible, then he will wreck my life. He will wreck me. He will He will wreck my, my goal of world domination, of, of living my life the way that I want to live it. And he does wreck us. But I could only see God as a threat. I couldn't see him as a blessing until the Spirit of God converted me. Notice the reason that the king gives for his fear. It goes something like this. If the Hebrews grow too big, they might join a foreign power and then escape from the land. This is ironic. This is a self-fulfilling fear. Quick, let's take action unless they, so, so to keep them from leaving, which is what we're going to see them do. But at this stage of the game, how likely is this? This is God's people. They're, they're experiencing blessing. They've been a blessing to Egypt, and now they're all of a sudden a threat. And, and the Pharaoh, in his paranoia, builds this what if upon what if upon what if. If they grow, and if war breaks out, and if they join the enemies, and if they fight against us, then they might leave the land. That's what, that's what unbelief does. It's, it, it creates paranoia. Pharaoh believes that his resource in the people of God is being threatened and doesn't view them as a blessing. And so this chapter unfolds as King Pharaoh tries to squash out the threat. He makes three attempts in, the, in chapter 1 to oppress God's people and, and to squash the threat that he feels. First, we see him forcing the people of God to serve as slaves. 
Verse 11, read with me. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. And the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the fields. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Now, no man has the right to own another man, not even the king of Egypt. Ownership of a human being is God's role. We were created in the image of God. He is our maker and our creator. He owns us. And yet, Pharaoh stands in the role of God in the life of God's people, setting himself as a God in their lives, controlling their days, even owning them as slaves. What we're going to see in the book of Exodus is this is, this is the beginning of a cosmic battle where the God of blessing stands opposed to the God of oppression. Notice how Moses tells us that, describes how bad this really was. He uses all of these descriptive words. Verse 14, he says, ruthlessly, bitter, hard service, work. Comes back to say ruthlessly again in case we didn't get it the first time. This is oppression like we don't know in this country. We've never experienced it in our generation. Previous generations have experienced it in our country where men have been made to work for other men as slaves. And yet we read in this story that the God of oppression is no match for the God of blessing. Verse 12, what happens? What's the result of this, of this attempt to squash the threat? God blesses his people in the midst of oppression and they continue to multiply and fill the earth. The more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread abroad. So his plans can't be thwarted by the power of Pharaoh. If you're going to keep score, God of blessing, one. God of oppression, zero. What about the second attempt? If Pharaoh can't squeeze the heart out of the Hebrews with his slave labor camp, maybe he can squeeze the life out of future generations. So Pharaoh moves from the adults and he moves to the children. And we see in verse 15 that Pharaoh calls together the head nurses of, of Israel and orders these two Hebrew midwives to do what? We're going to read now, verse 15. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra and the other Pua, when you serve as a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. So he commands them to murder these boys. You ever get yourself in a situation where you know what you're supposed to do, but it's really hard to do it? Kids, kids, when your parents tell you to do something and you don't do it, what happens? You get in trouble, right? Those of you who are working a job, you have a boss, your boss tells you something to do, gives you an assignment, and you don't do it, what happens? You get in trouble. You might lose your job at some point. The right response to such wickedness as we read here in this part of the story is obvious to us. It's obvious what these women are supposed to do. It's obvious how they're supposed to respond. But we have to remember that as we read the story that Pharaoh is the most powerful person in the entire world at this time. They're going to get into some serious trouble if they don't do what Pharaoh says. He's, he's operating like God. In fact, there's some evidence to suggest that, that Pharaoh thought he was God, that he was the sun God, Ra. So, as, as we hear these words commanded to them, they cannot easily be dismissed. Oof. 
kill these kids? Of course they're not going to do that. Really? Well, they face their own death, likely, if they don't kill these children. This is a, this is a, a pivotal moment in the story. Verse 17. But the midwives feared God. They feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and let the male children live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. (laughs) So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. Verse 21, and because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Now we read this story and we think, that is such a lame excuse. That is, that's absolutely laughable. Surely they could have come up with something better than, uh, it just happened too fast and we missed it every time, right? Oops, sorry, Pharaoh, we missed it again. But if you think about it, it's actually a perfect excuse, Because what does Pharaoh know about delivering babies? It's not like he's moonlighting, you know, off on the side as a labor delivery nurse. What's he supposed to say? How's he supposed to challenge the the, uh, veracity of their story? Now, these, these women, in their courage, they saved Israel. They saved the nation because without this decision of courage, there is no baby Moses. Shipra and Pua saved us because without baby Moses, there isn't David. And without David, there isn't Jesus. And without Jesus, there isn't salvation. So God, in his mercy, has recorded for us Shipra and Pua, and we should honor them and honor their names, which mean beautiful and mean beauty and splendor. And whereas the text doesn't even give us Pharaoh's name, He gives us their names. They saved Israel, and the people grew. The result of his evil act was that the people multiplied even more and grew strong. The God of blessing stands against the God of opposition. To nothing. On to the third attempt. Since slavery didn't work, since coercion to murder didn't work, now Pharaoh gives an executive order to his people that all Hebrews should throw their firstborn sons into the Nile. Verse 22, Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Now, if you're like me, and you read the Bible, and you read these stories, you're just kind of wanting to get to the action. Where's the, where's the punchline? Where's the, where's the story kind of come to a head, right? Don't let verse 22 pass you by without just stopping for a moment and thinking what it would be like, families in this, parents in this room who have sons, for, for, for every one of our sons who are born to be drowned, What would that do to a people? He's created legislative genocide. In some ways, it's no different than in our world, in our culture, our abortion laws. To live in this culture, to live in this time, to live in this period under this command would have been insanity. It would have been insane. As you would hear the cries of the families as they had their children taken from them. Pharaoh wanted the Nile to flow with the blood of children, and it would. But even as Pharaoh tries to snuff out the threat of God's blessing, God's plans cannot be thwarted. And rather than destroying God's people, Pharaoh was unwittingly setting the stage for the deliverer of God's people. 
See, out of the threat of death, the blessing of God comes in the form of a baby. Under this rule and this regime, God comes as one under this death, death sentence. His deliverer comes in the form of baby Moses, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Read with me in verse 1. Now, a man from the house of Levi went and took his wife, a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. We'll come back to that. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it, placed it among the reeds by the riverbank, and his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. In the midst of all of the killing, in the midst of all the bloodshed, one baby is protected and kept from harm. She lived with Moses for three months under the, the weight and the pressure of this sentence of execution. This reminds me of the stories you read of Nazi Germany where people are, are being held underground and are being protected even as the Nazis would come to the door and ask if they're hiding people. She's hiding her son. She knows he's in grave danger. She hides him for three months, and apparently at this point, something occurs where she realizes she can't hide him any longer, and his life is in even graver danger. And so she is so desperate to save the life of her little boy that she does what you have to be absolutely desperate to do, to put your baby boy in a makeshift little boat and to put him on a river that could capsize it at any moment and to send it down, she's at the point of, of utter desperation. Little does she realize that the future deliverer of God's people floats down a bloody river, being kept safe by God in this little basket. Actually, the word for basket here can be translated ark. We've seen God save his people from the judgment of waters through an ark before. And here he does it again. And even more than that, God has fixed the exact timing and route that Moses would take to arrive him at just the right spot. Let's finish reading our text from this morning. Verse 5. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young women walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, because she said, I drew him out of the water. It's interesting that while the spirit of the day was kill baby boys in the Nile, the very daughter of Pharaoh comes to this point and has a different approach. What she should have done was flip the basket over. What she does is have pity. And once again, in God's providence, Moses' sister Miriam is right there and comes up with this fantastic solution to go get Moses' mom to do what a normal mom should do, which is take care of their children, but yet now she gets paid for it. This is an unbelievable turn of events. She sends her baby down the river, Wondering if she'll ever see him again or if he'll live. And now she's got a job. This is incredible. She nurses him until he grows. He becomes Pharaoh's daughter. 
which means that at this point in the story, Moses is the Pharaoh's grandson. He's in the house of Egypt. The deliverer of Egypt will come from the house of Egypt. Amazing. It's an amazing story. So the question we ask ourselves is, where is God in all of this? Where is he? Do you realize that not not many of these things that we described involve God explicitly? We saw him one point with the, the midwives where he blessed them and he gave them families. All we've seen to this point are humans, people speaking, talking. We have We have Pharaoh, we have the midwives, we have the daughter, we have Miriam. You might read this story and think God is totally absent because all of the actors who are moving and who are controlling things are people, but God is not silent. He's not been silent. He is actually, without saying a word, the chief and central character in this unfolding drama. It's God who brought Joseph's family to Egypt. It's God who blessed the Hebrews with children to fill the earth. It's God who raised up Moses or who raised up Pharaoh. It's God who's working behind the murderous decree to bring about his plans. It's God who led the ark of Moses to safety right by where the Pharaoh's daughter was at. It's God who gave her the tenderness of heart. It's God who orchestrated the conversation between the Pharaoh's daughter and Miriam. It's God who gave Moses' mom her job. It's God who placed the deliverer of his people in the most powerful house under the most hated man alive. So why is this story important? Because it reminds the Israelites, as remember Moses is writing to them as they're wandering in the wilderness, And they're questioning God. They're questioning God's plans. They're questioning God's methods. They're they're doubting God's faithfulness. It would have reminded them that God always works for his people in the most unlikeliest of ways. He's always at work for his people, fulfilling his promises. It would remind him that God frustrates the plans of the wicked to bring about his deliverance. It would remind them that he delivers his people through his mighty power, not through their own self-effort. It would remind them that his plans can never be thwarted. The God of blessing is always greater than the God of oppression. Whether that be Pharaoh, whether that be Satan, whether that be any other ruler who has followed in his path ever since. All of the power of Pharaoh cannot keep God from working out his purposes. You want to kill all the babies? I'm going to bring the deliverer as a baby. God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. So if God's plans can't be thwarted, then God's plans can be trusted even when they are unconventional or even when they seem unorthodox. Even when God's plans don't meet your expectations, he can be trusted. We see that out of the midst of oppression, God rises blessing to the surface. Friends, this is the story of Jesus. The story of Jesus is the greater story of Moses, as we'll see throughout the whole book of Exodus. Moses is not the only baby God would use to save his people. Now, this baby points us to another baby who would come and who God would raise up as a greater deliverer, who also, like Moses, would come under the the threat of death. Remember Herod? He's a Pharaoh-like God imposter. And yet out of the midst of wicked threats, this baby, Jesus, would hold the blessed promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis 22 and on whom all salvation of all of God's people would rest. If we read that in Galatians 4, 16. Now, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring who is 
Christ. Exodus points us forward to the greater plan of God's Son, Jesus Christ, in whom the greater deliverance from sin has come. And while we're still waiting for the story of Exodus to unfold, we already know the story of Jesus. We've sung about it already today. He has come, he has lived, he was crucified, he died, he was buried in a grave. And then he raised, he was raised by the mighty power of God so that we would no longer put our hope for deliverance in our own self-effort, our own good works to get us to heaven. Oh, if only the scales would balance and maybe our our good works would, would exceed our bad works. Nope. He's come that we would move away from all of our works and trust in the deliverer who has come by believing in him and what he's done for us on the cross. So what are the implications of this for our lives? Three things, and we're going to expound upon these throughout the the whole study of Exodus, so I'm not going to spend too much time on them today, but three implications that rise to the surface. First, God is sovereign over the threats in your life. The God of Exodus is the God of Grace Church. God is sovereign over all things, apparent blessing and threats. He's sovereign over it all. So whatever threats you're facing today in your life, whatever oppression you're facing, whatever burdens you're being laid on uh, on you, whatever, whatever tireless work you've been giving yourself to, God is sovereign over all of those things. We must never lose hold of this truth to think that we live in a world where there is no order. No, there is. God is the one who sets it and determines it. He's sovereign over the threats in your life. Second, God's working his glory for you even when you don't know how. Even if you have to face a moment like Moses' mom where you have to put your most precious hopes into a basket, as it were, and send it down the river of destruction, God is working his glory out in your life. See, the thing we lose when we read the story as fast as we're reading it and there's no way around this, but, but the thing we lose is we lose the time between when she sends the boat down and when she gets the awesome job. We just think she sent the boat down, she got a job. This is cool. The heartache that she had to sit in, not knowing that God would deliver her. We all sit in those heartaches, right? But God is working his glory even when we don't know how. So Exodus 1, as we start the book, reminds us that God moves in mysterious ways. His wonders to perform. And third, God's plan for your life can be trusted because he has proved his methods. So this book is written to strengthen the Israelites in the wilderness to tell them God's methods, unorthodox, unconventional as they may seem, out of line with our expectations, they can still be trusted because he is a faithful God. And he has proved it He has proved it at the times when he seems to be most silent. Even when God is silent, he is still at work. And sometimes when he's silent, he does his best work, which we see as we look upon the cross of Jesus Christ. Where blessing has been interpreted as threat and where the God of oppression has tried to snuff it out When Jesus turns his eyes to the Father and cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he hears back the reply of silence. It's in these moments that God is doing his absolute best work. His methods are proven, even if they're unlikely, even if they're unorthodox. It's the heart of unbelief to call God's blessing a threat. So let this story this morning strengthen your faith in a God who rules over his people, who rules over the affairs of the world, who cannot be thwarted in his plans, who cannot succumb to the threats of the God of oppression, and who is always working for the good of his people, beginning in Exodus 1 by preserving the deliverer, the baby Moses, so that we would see our salvation in Christ come to pass. Let's pray. Oh, Father, as we come to this time of communion, which 
helps us to remember Christ. Lord, we thank you this morning that you do rule over every aspect of our lives. Lord, I know that there are people here this morning who are struggling under the weight of their own sin. Lord, maybe not even, not even ever heard the gospel message this morning. Lord, you're sovereign over that because here they are. I pray, God, that you would help every person in this room to see the provision you've made for their lives, and that they would find the answers to their spiritual health, not in, in self-esteem or in doing something better or cutting this out of their life or cutting that out of their life. Lord, would you bring them to the foot of your cross and show them the glory of Christ who has been resurrected for them. Lord, there are those who are in this room who are coming today who are under the burdens of, of their work or who are under the burdens of strained relationships or who are under the burdens of, of the unknown future that lies ahead or who are under the burdens of, of a health issue that, that won't go away. God, we pray that you would strengthen them this morning with the truth of your sovereign goodness. Lord, would you dump blessings upon our heads in the way that Paul writes in Ephesians, that through Christ and in him, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places is ours. Would you bring that reality to light, Lord? Would you cause our hearts to love Jesus all the more today? In Christ's name we pray, amen.